नमस्कार टुडे इज अ मोमेंटस ओकेजन फॉर अस एज वी होस्ट दिस एक्सक्लूसिव इंटरव्यू फॉर द वेरी फर्स्ट टाइम इनसाइड आवर जाजपुर प्लान प्रमाइजेस इट इज एन एब्सोल्यूट प्रिविलेज टू ब्रिंग सच सिग्निफिकेंट कॉन्वर्सेशंस टू द हार्ट ऑफ आवर ऑपरेशंस इन दिस एडिशन ऑफ आवर पार्टनर आवर प्राइड वी मीट द टनलर डॉक्टर आनल डेक्स same man who helped rescue 41 workers who were trapped inside a tunnel in Uttarakhand last year Dr Dix currently serves as the president of the International Tunneling and Underground Space Association he is widely known as the world's leading technical expert in all things underground let's talk to him about his journey and hear his thoughts about modern day infrastructure thank you so much for agreeing to do this and giving us the time sir my pleasure so please tell us about yourself and about your journey as being the president of the international tunneling and underground space association so my name is professor arnold dix and i'm originally a mining geologist a professor of engineering and lawyer and my career has entirely been focused on the underground and i have the honor of being elected president of the international tunneling and underground space association uh that's an organization of more than 80 member nations several hundred thousand members and we specialize in all things underground and we're the primary advisors to the united nations so if it's underground i'm your guy i grew up working in a family business and from very young i fell in love with of all things rocks uh and and all things natural so i i have this um love affair since being a child in the natural world with a particular love of rocks of all things and that journey took me obviously to university where i i studied um into the mining sector into the underground into corporate law into disasters uh into virtually everything underground so my career is i i tell young ones my career is like a sailing boat that goes with the wind if i'm blown in one direction i just go in that direction if i blow in another direction i go in that direction but always i work hard and always i try to be the very best i can at whatever i'm doing we are living in an age of rapid urbanization how do you see the role of tunnels and underground spaces evolving in this world and why do you think it is critical for modern day infrastructure development so right now i'm in india the largest country on earth you've topped 1.4 billion people you've got the largest cities in the world the most densely populated cities in the world and you're not alone and what we're seeing is right around the world at the moment people flocking to the cities in search of a better life in search of education in search of clean water in search of medicine it's urban environments people want but with that come incredible challenges and it's in those areas of challenges that the underground it's not only uniquely placed it's it's essential so for for delivering clean water what you can drink and not get sick for dealing with sewerage for dealing with transport for dealing with energy for dealing with uh, safe shelters dealing with all these things the underground is perfect in these urban environments and also it liberates the surface for the beautiful things so if you can put a road underground you can have a garden on the surface if you can put your trains underground you can stop the the blight in the sky this it's so for me it's just so so clear that urbanization the challenges of the modern world require underground solutions for urbanization and also from a sustainability environmental esg point of view also it it has the best footprint in my mind delivering much better cities much more livable cities much more social justice just it's better so you've been in the industry for a very long time what is your take in regards to the input material used in infrastructure tunnels in particular i think the challenge that we face is that 
tunnels in particular essentially last forever. And so sometimes people come with a mentality that a tunnel is like a building. And so its design life might be just 20 years or 30 years, but that's not it at all. The tunnels that were built hundreds of years ago in our cities, cities like London, New York, Paris, Boston, the tunnels are still there and they're still in use. So the huge effort to build the underground, if, underground infrastructure needs a different way of thinking about how we, we fit it out, how we put in all the essential services, how we actually manage it. And so I think there's been a disconnection between this incredibly resilient spaces that we build underground and a lot of the electromechanical systems and fit outs that we have because the tunnels are forever, but often the equipment doesn't last so long. And so that's why in my capacity as president, of the International Tunneling Association, always on the lookout for things that last because the spaces we build, we need longevity. We need things to last with us. Speaking of longevity, uh, what do you think about the use of stainless steel in such infrastructures? From my perspective, stainless steel offers the, the, life, the life that I want to be coupled to the infrastructure that I build. So often I see the, the supporting infrastructure in the spaces I build destroyed, literally destroyed, literally falling off the walls, literally no more in as little as 10 years and certainly within 30 years. So typically what we see is the initial decisions to build the underground infrastructure are often with a, um, I call it an L1. So a, what's the lowest price? But this is crazy. And the reason it's crazy is if you really need the infrastructure, it means that forever it's going to be needed. That means every day. So if you're building infrastructure that's needed every day, why would you on purpose fit it with equipment materials that will only last for 10 or 20 years? Because if you do that, this infrastructure that you've built can't be used in 10 or 20 years and you have to build it again. You have to put the equipment in. So from my perspective, having this alignment of the infrastructure, which as I say, lasts forever, with equipment and other materials that also, as best we can, last forever, actually delivers the sort of resilience, the sort of total life, lifespan um, performance that that's, I'm looking for in the underground. So stainless steel, stain, <laughs> stainless steel is an obvious choice. And, it's not an obvious choice theoretically, it's an obvious choice because it's been proven to work. It's, we know that it works. You should spec the steel for the particular conditions you have underground, often harsh conditions, often with harsh geotechnical conditions, geochemical conditions, and it will last. So for me, it's very straightforward. It's, it's the perfect marriage. I build, I'm involved with an industry that builds infrastructure forever, and stainless steel lasts essentially forever as well. So you are considered a leading technical expert in your field. What according to you has been the most uh, challenging task that you have undertaken so far? And if you could share your key takeaways from that. The most challenging task I've ever done was actually here in India last year. And I think being asked to assist the wonderful team at the Silk Yara Rescue was the, the hardest. And, and the reason it was the hardest is we had everything to lose. So normally when I'm involved in a disaster, mostly you're trying to learn the lessons and you're trying to you know, make sense of some terrible thing that's happened. But in the case of Silk Yara, <laughs> everyone was alive. And so actually we had everything to lose. And that's why at the time I was saying, it's not a disaster, it's a rescue. We can make it a disaster, <laughs> but let's keep it a rescue. And I think the key takeaway there was the importance of humbleness, humanity, being a human being, being a little sensitive, because the engineering was everywhere. But what we needed was everyone to work together and for everyone to understand that there were 41 kids in there who we were going to bring home and to bring a softness to the mission. Because if 
And this is really interesting because here I am as a scientist engineer and you might see my eyes are a little sparkly at the moment because it's it actually quite serious for me. Brings back memory. Yeah. Um, it's the humanness of what we do. So for us in the tunnelling, we have to work as a team to keep everybody alive. The infrastructure we build has to be safe because we're the experts in this. So if someone gets on the Delhi Metro, they don't need to know how we do it. They just need to know that we do it. And part of that, part of keeping it safe, and for those engineers who are listening, we know we need the cable trays to stay up. <laughs> we, need, we need the bolts to stay in the wall. Uh, we need the cabinets to remain uh, protected from the elements. We need that because to, to move millions of people safely requires a total system to work like as one team. And that's why the quality of the materials, including the stainless, is so important because it's too easy for people not to maintain. It's too easy not to notice that the bolts have corroded in the wall. It's too easy not to see that the cable tray is about to fall on the train. And if that happens, we, we can't deliver the safe outcome, just like in the food industry, just like uh, in the pharmaceutical industry just like in space, like all, all the things that you're involved in. So you produce a quality product and everyone relies on it. My sector relies on it as well. So that's why, that's why it's important to me. So you have traveled across the globe. You've been to many countries. You've seen the infrastructure. Pretty much everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> what insights or practices that you believe will further enforce, further strengthen India's infrastructure development goals? I think it was really well captured by Union Minister Gadkari yesterday at the meeting that he came and spoke at. I think for India, capturing the lessons learnt from all the sectors, so at the moment you've got a very active hydro sector, metro sector, high-speed rail sector, highway sector, underground energy sector and defence sector and all of them are busy building tunnels. And to consolidate that learning and to actually as one nation come together, I think is, a, is the step. It's like the next step as, it, as India accelerates. And in his speech yesterday, uh, spoke about India's ascent to, I think, third largest economic power in the world. I think that might be a medium term, not a long-term goal. I suspect it might be more than that. And that that's what I feel here now and I see it and I think if anything India is a little modest about its capacity and in terms of modesty I look to the space program how did you do that like how did you end up getting with rocket the kind of the budget that yeah with the budget you've got and and firstly there was your lunar mission and then there was the mission to the sun and you've you've built a really reliable um, lift rocket system, um, you've got your own technology. So this tells me that not only have you got vision, but you've got capacity. And I like to think that if you can do that for outer space, you can do it for under space. <laughs> so this is the under space program of India. And I'm confident that you can do it and are doing it. And that's what I'm saying. What do you think that, uh, what are the things that we should focus on to ensure safety and sustainability in all infrastructure development in the country? So even though I'm a scientist and even though I'm an engineer and all those sorts of things, I think the people, because it's not about process, it's about hearts. So if you've got the hearts, you've got the minds. And what I'm noticing in your young, so your young engineers, I, I work with different universities, they're engaged, they're, they're wanting to build a nation, they're wanting a better future for themselves and their families. They're worried about the environment. They're worried about sustainability. But more than that, they feel empowered. This is my sense. They feel empowered. They will make a difference. This generation will make a difference. And capturing that energy and actually saying to our young, you are the generation. You will deliver this nation. You have our blessing. Go forth that actually will deliver the sustainability development goals, that will deliver the social equity that you're looking for. It will increase 
the, the standards of living, lifestyle, life expectancy, health and general well-being because, because the hearts want it. I mean, everything follows after that. So that's my, my feeling from me, you know, old bloke, <laughs> coming to the end of my career, but that's my feeling. That's my sense of the future. And I think the young are going to do it. I, I, and, I, and I think they want to do it. And the reason they want to do it is the world at the moment looks really, really bad. And I think they can rightly blame their generation above them for having navigated us into this position. And for whatever reason, we're fumbling things at the moment. So I'm saying to the young ones, come on, stand next to me. I'll share whatever wisdom I have. I'll share whatever knowledge I have. It's your world. Come on, let's make it better. And I, and I think quality companies producing quality product, you're stainless. Quality organisations like mine producing a better future for all of humankind and the environment, water, sewage, energy, transport. Together, we actually do the real stuff. Like it's not the blah, blah of a, of a narrative, this is, we actually make the future through the things that we build together. And I think that's fantastic. And on that hopeful and positive note, I think we've come to the end of the interview. Thank you so much for giving us the time. It was an absolute pleasure having this conversation with you. Thank you for having me.